Hello and welcome to Absolutely Not. Thank y'all so much for being here today. My name is Kay Maltau Thomas Stroll. My pronouns are they, them, and you can learn more about me on my website, www.kstroll.com. Real quick, if you appreciate the work that I do here or elsewhere, please visit my Ko-fi page where you can join the layered tiered community, leave a tip or buy one of my workbooks on boundaries or psychological safety. Support my work so I can continue to do this work. The keywords for this episode are compassion fatigue, activist burnout, and internalization. I encourage y'all to look up the definitions of these words and compare them to the definitions you carry with you on a daily basis. If you need help comparing, please let me know. Today's episode is titled, Live the World You Envision. Mm. And this is with our amazing special guest, Taj M. Smith, he, him, his. Taj is a speaker, transgender, excuse me, trans, transgender educator, and founder of Rooted Respite, a virtual burnout support community serving activists, DEI practitioners, and others committed to creating a more equitable world. Taj's work explores the spaces where spirit, spirituality, justice, and identity overlap. He is a Black transgender man who is deeply curious about the way spirit and identity interact to produce hopeful futures. Ooh. He is Black, queer, transgender, and neurodivergent. Tosh, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I am I know we just talked about this, but I, I appreciate you just existing like for who you are because it's helped me a lot in my journey. And I know it's probably helped other people. You are a coach of sorts, and I'm wondering why you chose to focus on the people that you're focusing on and the burnout of activists and DEI professionals. Yeah, so, I mean, I started being embedded in activist spaces when I was probably 16 or 17, just like really got into uh, the, the, just the the mess of it it all. Um, As a kid, I grew up in a low income household. And so like, you know seeing my mom struggle with trying to provide for me and my brother and then uh when we would have to look for houses and like places to live because we had to move like it seemed like we were moving every couple of years or so um just seeing how hard it was on her to have to call these places and then tell her that the place is available she goes to look at it and then all of a sudden it's not available but then the listing is still up like two weeks later you know like that sort of thing like seeing that and saying saying something's not right here like i really chose to get involved in like whatever activism i could uh like queer activism especially uh i was one of the few out kids in my high school and um coming up through all of these activist spaces the consistent thread that i saw was people being up till you know one two three in the morning preparing for the rally preparing for uh the the election the um whatever big event was happening and just running themselves ragged and then ready to do it again the next weekend and then like i felt like especially like when i was in college i felt like the response for us being like to how you're like this, the response to how are you doing shouldn't, shouldn't always be, I'm so tired. (laughs) Um, And it just so often is. Uh, And like, even now, like seeing the way that DEI is being handled uh, publicly and um, just seeing like a lot of the professionals that I'm, that are in my circle, just like, uh, just seeing their their positions get cut left and right and it's just it seems like there is so much burnout happening in these spaces and but the expectation is that we weather through it we keep we keep going uh but you know the reality is that like we're not we're not machines we're not infinite so like we need to rest and like our resting is actually part of uh part of justice (laughs) so that's why i chose it and i mean like it's a little selfish and like me helping the people who are most likely but i mean that's what i know how to do because that's what i did for myself so 
I, sorry, I have like a really sharp pain in my chest when you said that your activism like started at 16, 17. And I need anyone who is listening to this, who does the same kind of work that Tasha does or the same kind of work that I do to really sit down and swallow that. Like, when did your activism start? Because baby, we, I'm, I got pricks in my knees now. So I've been doing it for a while and I need a lot of us to accept that. There are a lot of practitioners, like you said, who are who are literally dying um, because of this work. There are a lot of historical figures who have died in early, like in their fifties because they have done this work since 16 and did it until their fifties. And it just wears on you from time to time or all of the time. And the expectation you said in society is that well, this is the work that you chose to do. Continue to do it until you die. When did you make the realization that that's not the exception you have to have for yourself, I guess? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> you know, it took a long time. It probably wasn't until I was in my mid-20s, um, mid to late 20s, when I realized I was like, it doesn't have to be like this. Um I worked on the Yes on Three campaign in Massachusetts. And that campaign, I mean, it was it was a beautiful experience in a lot of ways. And it was uh it was it was a successful campaign, one of like the first ballot initiative that I worked on that actually was uh that was a win uh in protecting trans rights um, at the ballot. So like that's that's great. And at the same time, like for me doing the faith organizing um it was it was a struggle to get folks to really like step into uh leadership positions volunteers to step into leadership to be able to take some of the workload off of me so like i was running all throughout the state basically to, uh as often like as as many days as are in the week i was in a different location throughout the state and like my partner was the one who actually was like, you know, this world that you're fighting for, this uh, th this world of trans inclusion that you're fighting for, like, you know, you get to participate in that too. It's for you. And that just hit me. It sunk me really. Like, I was, I think I was sitting, I was sitting on our couch and I just went, I just felt my whole body just like <sighs> drop into my seat. And I was just like, wow. And at that moment, I was just like, I'm so tired. And like seeing other the other trans uh, organizers on this campaign, like seeing how how hard we were working to bring uh, this world into being, and uh, just how tired we were uh, to create a space for other trans folks to feel honored and accepted. And that's so often the case, I think, with like. Uh, with trans folks, especially like we do this work, we're in this movement and we do it for other people, but like we get to participate in it too. And like, <laughs> for me, not even, not even realizing that until like my, my, until 2018, really 2018 is, I think up until that point, I always thought that the world I was working for was uh, something I was never going to see. Um, what I wrote down is it's not fair. <laughs> and it's just, it's just not fair that you probably are working towards a world that you, um, while we're, we're, we are reaping a lot of benefits of it, the work that you're doing, the work that other trans activists are doing, like, but the, what we really want is probably for the next generation. And it's just not fair that it's, sorry, excuse me. It's just not fair. And so um, part of that resistance, like you talked about, is taking rest back because you should not be working yourself to death for human rights. These are basic ass rights. And I'm about to work myself to death for them. Um, somebody else has to take on that responsibility. How often you are you placing that responsibility of like working towards basic human rights on people who are not trans? Oh, uh, <laughs> um, 
I feel like that's that's that is a question for, that's a societal question right there uh because like like black trans people black queer people have been at the forefront of every single movement for human rights at least in the united states probably uh beyond uh so like for us like we're often the first or like we're literally putting our bodies on the line and like knowing that that even if even if something comes through like 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 civil rights or or like whatever kind of human rights we're fighting for at the moment like knowing that like the person standing behind me isn't necessarily going to have my back you know like it's it's this it's one of the problems i think i think about this a lot with identity politics too like um just like the the general idea that like you only fight for what's yours you even though like we're all in this together you know like the 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 person who's gonna like run me down for being black is also the person who's gonna like run me down for being trans you know like and that's that's the reality and like it's it takes too much of our humanity to keep having to explain that to people so that they show up so i mean i i want to i take that question and i turn it outward because <laughs> um, like you know i've been here um I started transitioning in 2009 and I've been here ever since. And uh, like, I'm still here doing the trainings, doing the, uh, the, the trans inclusion work. And it's still meeting the same resistance, still at hearing people ask the same questions. So like, yeah, at what point isn't going to be not trans people doing this work? And I... I'm so appreciative of the work that you're doing and your honesty that you've shared here because so many people need to hear this, that it takes so much of yourself, like so much. Like even if you give me a check for five bajillion, quadrillion dollars or whatever, I'm still here actively doing the work and you're still um, kind of to my own detriment. Like I have to share my experiences here and there may be a lot of people listening who are just not going to get it and not see the humanity in any of the people who are speaking to them. Um, sorry. What I wrote down is what you said, you only fight for what's yours. To the people who are only fighting for what's theirs, I guess, how is that? Or I feel like that doesn't align at all with the title of this episode, Live the World You Envision. Um, so, so how do we get those two to align? Or will those those sentiments ever align? I think they can align. Um, and I think it takes some deep introspection on behalf of the people who are showing up in the movements to really like ask themselves why they're showing up, what keeps them showing up, what are they fighting for? Like, what are you fighting for? Uh, and if it's if it's a liberated world, who's in that world? And if it's not a complete vision of who's in that world, like if if it's a world where uh, where there's no trans people, then like that that that's got to change. Like, so it ta I think it's going to take some deep reflection on like the the on behalf of movements to really like think through like what is what what is the vision that they're fighting for? Because I mean like. For me, at least, like a liberated world looks like a world in which every every person uh, can, has what they need to thrive, not just survive, to thrive. Uh, they are rested, uh, and uh, they experience joy daily. And like, that's every person. 
regardless of of anything of of any identity or anything every single person so like in that vision there's trans people there's black people there's latine people there's white people there's like there's queer people there's just there's you know every everybody uh and i think for too many folks like there's too many folks in movements that are trying to replicate the system that we have with themselves on top and like that's that's not gonna do it you know like i'm not trying to get free so i can oppress somebody else like i'm trying to get free so we can all be free i'm so glad you just fucking said that i I was thinking of of the question this is a question i've been asking myself for like a really long time like um, so many organizations they grow big because they get a bunch of donations and then they keep spreading the word. But then at some point they mold into the system that they're fighting against. They mold into like you become a capitalist system, your little hierarchy, all of that. So I think about how you're a burnout coach for activists. How I guess I guess that answers my question. Like how small is how small an activist can you be or how big an activist can you be to like care about burnout or rest or yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it like, it takes all kinds, <laughs> every level. Um, yeah. Every level of activist I think can, uh, can be somebody who cares about rest. And I honestly, I think the more that uh, like these bigger organizations are caring about the re- the rest uh, uh, and restedness of like smaller smaller grassroots organizations, smaller activists, uh, smaller, um, you know, like uh, the more that happens, then the more power I think like the movement can actually build because, uh, you know, it's those big organizations that are getting the funds, um, and they're the ones who are able to hire staff and be able to, uh, you know, have things like leave policies and vacation time. <laughs> where Some of the smaller organizations like can't always do that. So like if, if, if the Audrey Lord uh, center in New York got a quarter of the funding that the HRC gets, just like a quarter of it, that would do wonders for that center, right? Like, and they would be able to hire the staff that would be able to uh, uh, um, replicate their, like, that would be able to, like, embed, like, redundancy in the organization so that they can actually, like, let their people rest. Like, so, I mean, it, 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 I want to see like folks in the 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 more the larger more well known more powerful orgs like showing up for some of these smaller orgs and like learning how they can uh distribute redistribute that that wealth of resources and I mean I know that's like scarcity is a is a whole mess of a mindset that we're born into <laughs> And, and, uh, it's totally possible to change it. It takes work. It takes effort. But once we can live into that, uh, abundance and know that like, when we're taking care of each other, we are all taken care of. That is, (laughs) that is, that's, what's going to change it. What I... What I love about everything that you've said in this conversation is the fact that so many people who are doing this work need to take a step back and understand what, like the work that they're doing, like internally and how they're measuring their own success. Like the way that you have measured your success in the work that you're doing, like, you know, exactly the kind of world that you want, which is why you're doing the work that you're doing. Also, just like how we described the organizations, I love that you put the quotation around small, like if we're measuring by like 
this is a small organization because they don't have enough funds. Well, why the fuck don't they have these funds? Like, where, where are the funds going? Why is this organization more successful? And I'm glad you say HRC because um, that brings me to the next, like, you are very specific in who you cater to. And you talk about, like, people like me. HRC be wild. Like, the, the, the HRC here in Dallas, like, they're like, oh, yeah, we just, like, be helping people, like, who though, like be very specific. So I know one, if I feel safe here, because and two, so I know where the fuck these funds are going. Like this is, that's very wild. So I hope anyone who's listening to this, who is an activist or um, if you're thinking about becoming a part of an organization who is small or who is large, just be being very specific. Like how Tosh said is like, not only helpful to yourself and not reaching burnout because you'll be part of an organization. You're like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, what are we doing here? But you'll also be able to internally be like, okay, I know that I'm on the right track and these are the people that I want to be around. That was so fucking insightful. I really appreciate you breaking that down for a lot of us. Um, and that helps me because I'm, I'm constantly doing that, going into the community and being like, okay, but like, what do y'all do? what what is going on here have you ever had an experience like that where you went to like an organization like what i just don't understand oh yes oh yes uh i worked on the no on prop 8 campaign in california um and just a lot of that work there i felt like <laughs> just like who is this for who is this serving uh what are, what are we doing here because i mean like for the most part the folks in my circle could give two shits about marriage equality <laughs> but you know like but the, that health care piece of it yeah we want that that uh that you know those tax breaks yeah we want that which says to me like okay so that's financial security and health care that's got that two things that don't have anything to do with marriage, but do. So like in like all of these fights for marriage equality in like uh like the looking at the 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 way that they really did the campaigning for that was appealing to like um to uh middle class women between the ages of 24 and 35. Um, who could resonate with the idea of their own weddings. Um, and so like, yeah, you played for that sympathy, but like, like that, like that, that's not, that's not who showed up. <laughs> so like speaking to the people on their terms on like healthcare, financial security, and like, like how, like how whatever you're working for is going to bring that into the picture like that's a that's a th like that's a whole other a whole other can of something <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean uh showing up to these places and just wondering like like what is what is going on what is it you're actually doing and where is this money going like i it's hard because I I'm work I'm also working part time for like a fledgling nonprofit right now, um that does like peer support for trans folks, uh and it's it's like I love this organization, and one of the biggest things that we're coming up against is like finding people to fund operating costs because don't no nobody wants to donate for like overhead, but like <laughs> you know uh overhead is a big part of capacity building for this work so like but there is a point at which overhead starts to consume too much and it needs to be redirected back into programming and back into communities and through like micro grants and stuff like that i think a great example of this is the trans lifeline like they're just doing like they've got their hotline going they uh they 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 pay their people as well as they can and their people get rest um uh they they issue micro grants to the community like like 
and they have these overhead costs that are high, but you know, like a lot of this, a lot of the money that like people give, like also goes back into directly into the community. So like, I feel like striking that balance is really important. And there's too many big organizations out there that are just not, not, or yeah, they're just not doing it. <laughs> if they are, Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> like if they are doing it, then it's on such a level that like is not on the level that like that I'm on. <laughs> so, you know, if if they're doing it for lobbyists and whatnot, then you know that's a that's another thing. I have a dog. Um, but I love that you said that it takes striking the balance. There are going to be so many people who listen to this episode and think, I want this. I want to not be constantly tired all the time. I want to have balance in my life. And I want to be able to write down the type of world that I'm going towards. Like the reason I'm doing this work is to reach this specific type of world. The people that are thinking that, what would be the top three tips you would share with them? about starting to get this, um, to strike up a balance in their life. Yeah, so uh, the first thing is really getting clear about that picture of the world that you envision. And then uh, working backwards from there, like, like asking yourself like, what is the world I envision? And then what uh, what needs to happen socially to get there? What needs to happen for me? individually to to keep myself uh to preserve myself to be able to uh get there and a lot of times um at least i found this for me when i was when i was starting to ask myself these big questions like the things that i found that i was that like the things that i needed for myself uh were also the things that it was going to take for other people to be able to step into that world so like for me it's been like clear boundaries um between <laughs> my my work and my personal life um and uh uh like i in most of my email signatures i think there's only like one email signature i have that doesn't have it but i have that like there's a quote from trisha hershey hersey in there about like how about rest being resistance and uh, that, you know, if you email me uh, Monday through Friday, at, at, if you email me Monday through Thursday after 4.30, you can expect an email the next day. If you email me after 4.30 on a Friday, it's I, I'm not getting to it until Monday. <laughs> um, so like having those, the, that clarity around that. So that way I can, I, I set myself up for rest in that way. <laughs> So that way I'm not worried about it because everybody knows I ain't checking my email. And like for me, I'm, uh, I live with multiple mental health conditions. So it's a lot easier for me to set boundaries via like writing. We talked about this, like I'd be sending hella emails before a guest comes on that just like breaks it the fuck down. Like, Hey, this is what I expect. This is what our relationship is going to look like. And it's because it's really hard for me. Like I've been in a lot of shitty relationships. So it's hard for me to say that in front of people sometimes. And if it's easier for you to write it down, just like Taj said, like put it somewhere where somebody's going to see it in the email signature or put it somewhere where, or yeah, it's funny that you just mentioned Trisha Hersey, the Nat Bishop. Um, I just emailed her to be like, hey, would you like to be a guest on the podcast? And she has this response that's like, hey, um, all it just lists everything. Just like, hey, you're doing great. Um, I don't do podcasts no more. But it's like an automated email that already says like, baby, I don't do all of this, this, this. So, but much love to you, like out of love. And I love that so much. Like I just screenshotted it. That's finna go with mine. But yeah, that, and those are the people we're looking towards. Also that like, Everyone that you mentioned in this podcast episode, like, I hope that whoever's listening to this is like, okay, these are the people that I need to get more aligned with if I want less burnout and more rest. You say Audrey Lord, you said Trisha Hershey, like, 
and of course reach out to Taj. But thank you so much for breaking this down. I'm I'm so grateful for this episode. Are there any last minute sprinkles that you'd like to share with the audience? Uh, last minute sprinkles. If uh, you know you want to check things out, check out rootedrespite.com. Um, yeah, uh, we got a twelve week uh burnout recovery program going on called Get Your Life. So you know you come on, get your life. <laughs> I really love that. Get your life. I really love that. I, well, absolutely not, but like, I love that. <laughs> um, and to everyone who's really interested in this, um, his information will be in the show notes when this episode is published. Tosh, thank you so much for being here and sharing all of the everything that you've shared today. I hope that anyone who's listening to this is able to get that clear vision. And of course, if you need help, please reach out. Um, keep setting those boundaries and saying absolutely not to anything unaligned. We will see you next time. Bye.